So, uh, VAT. Um, Abby Tarran asked me, um, how many countries have VAT? And I looked it up in Wikipedia, and it said 104 do and 22 don't. But there are more than 200 countries in the world, so that can't be the right answer. Um, uh, I counted at least 160. And if you go back in history, in 1973, when the UK joined the European Union and had to implement VAT as a condition of going into the European Union, or the common market, it was in, as it was then called, um, there were about 20 countries in the world with VAT. So it's grown, and basically everywhere's got it except for here, um, for reasons that we'll come on to. And GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council countries, don't have it. And Burma doesn't have it yet, but probably will. Um, there's a, a, an enormous amount of um, pressure from the G20 on tax havens, and that's squeezing them very, very hard, as maybe we've heard in, in other sessions. Uh, that's causing a number of those island territories in particular to, to think about VAT as well. So it will continue to grow. Um, and that's happened really under the um, guidance, the direction of the IMF. The IMF love that. They like taxes where if you put up the rate, you can get some more money next month. And if you think about it on a, a more, in a more expansive way, maybe you can say, or maybe they would say, that VAT has saved Europe from bankruptcy. I don't know whether that's true, but it's, it's probably nearly true. And economists love it. Um, they love it. I don't know how many economists there are in the audience, but remember all those perfect competition models we did at university? VAT doesn't interfere with them. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing for me is how VAT is also a French invention, and they've spent their whole you know, life as a nation interfering with free markets. So I can't quite join those things up, but maybe Frédéric can enlighten us. But that's why they like it. It doesn't distort economic decision-making, either domestically or internationally, for the most part although there are some exceptions to that. So, going to the other extreme, um, how do you try and deal with this um, as a tax director? Um, firstly, give it the right attention. Um, if you're a tw I recently went to see a business that's $20 billion, $30 billion business. They have no VAT function, and they're all over the world. VAT is being done in little... Um, parts of the finance function all over the world, there's no common control. But this is probably 20% of their turnover, um, with, you know, roughly. So the cash throughput is just huge, and there's really very little control in it, and there's plenty of places where it can go wrong. Uh, as Alain said, and I won't dwell on it for the moment, invest in technology. Um, you can't get a transactional tax right if you're an organization of any scale unless you have some uh, automation in place. Um, you know, you guys know more about it than I do. I mean, the, 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 taking this issue on is about, is raising, I think, it's, 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 it's the heart of the issue of the independence of the states. Apart from all the horrible complexity that having VAT overlaid on the, 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 the local sales taxes would, 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 would be. Um, and I guess, you know, thinking about it and thinking the impact on business, I think, well, so that's just too complex, they'll never do it. But of course, that isn't the conclusion for legislators, because we've got all sorts of taxes that are too complex for people to comply with. Why not have another one? Yeah. We, we get that competitive advantage that you get through VAT, the non-distortive. You've already got that distortive bit, you're just layering something else on top of it, so you're not getting that benefit. Um, VAT is a good tax on banks and insurance companies, and policymakers like to tax banks and insurance companies at the moment, so that it might be appealing, but I just think it's just too politically hard and actually too economically hard. But there are places in the world that do this type of thing. India is getting there, yeah? And Brazil is there. It has multi-layered VAT on a, in a, on a federal basis. And I think these are two of the most difficult places on earth to do business. These two and China, just about the most difficult places on earth. So somebody suggested to me another model, which I haven't looked at in detail, Canada m would be a nicer model for you guys, but um, maybe that's to be researched for another time. But you'd really look more like Brazil or India with your existing taxes. So I think it's a, it's a horrible scenario, and I hope it doesn't happen. So um, if you're... Um, in, uh, uh, if you're a global tax director running a big business, you've, you've got VAT issues all over the world. Um, if you're of any size in this day and age, you should really have somebody 
looking responsible to, for, for, for the VAT issues, to whom those issues filter up an expert within the business. It's got to be cost effective to do that. Yeah? Um, getting it right in the accounting systems, as you know, if you're turning over hundreds of thousands, millions of transactions, um, getting it right there is, saves a huge amount of money later in the process and, of course, hopefully prevents penalties, interest, all those sorts of things that, that, that are associated with bad compliance. Um, getting a grip on what's going on, having internationally and having some common policies and standards in respect to VAT management, I think, are important. So you know that your hub in Singapore, running Asia, is doing pretty much the same things and working in a similar way to what's happening in Europe and South America. And there could be local differences, but for VAT, there's enough similarity conceptually in the tax for you to have substantially common policies on those types of things. And I think where I've, you know, some, some businesses have huge VAT teams, um, particularly in the oil sector where they, they get into excise and, and other uh, indirect taxes. But um, a, a small focused team of people who are internationally aware really adds a huge amount of value. So we spent as an indirect tax group uh, a day in the Netherlands with a Hong Kong company, it's a global company. They basically run uh, their central functions with 300 people, three of whom are VAT experts uh, who, who, who manage everything all over the world. Um, and they put in place these types of processes, policies, um, and they handle all the, uh, all the issues arising from uh, VAT coming from all over the world. They let a lot, of the biz a lot of that stuff is then filtered down to the individual business because this should be managed ultimately in a finance function. But, you know, with the amounts at stake, it's worth having that that top level review. So, um, to summarize, and I don't think I've overrun too much, um, I think there's almost no chance of getting VAT here in the, in, in the short term. Um, uh, so, I think it's something to keep an eye on, and it's interesting, but uh, I think the chances are negligible. But you do need to think about it everywhere else, and it's still growing everywhere else. And I think at the heart of it are actually three things. You know? um, the people that you've got managing it, the technology that you can uh, put in place over time, and also the advisors that you use. So um, we have a great time as a global indirect tax team working with some very large international clients. It's great fun. And uh, uh, if we get the chance to have some more from this meeting, we'd be delighted. So thank you very much.